Coming up on DTNS, the NBA loops in Microsoft to help you get the most out of games when games return. Why SMR is good if you mean the podcast, but not good as the architecture of your NAS hard drive. Plus, how the workplace will change when we're allowed back into the office. This is the Daily Tech News for Friday, April 17th, 2020 in Los Angeles. I'm Tom Merritt. And from Studio Redwood, I'm Sarah Lane. From Columbus, Ohio, I'm Rob Dunwood. Drawing the top tech stories from Cleveland, Ohio, I'm Len Peralta. And uh, from Overcast, Southern California Skies, I'm the show's producer, Roger Chang. We were just having a, uh, a conversation about misophonia and uh, how it affects anniversary dinners. Among many other things, you can get that wider show uh, on Good Day Internet. Become a member at patreon.com slash DTNS. Let's start with a few tech things you should know. Microsoft's Windows 10 May 2020 update will begin rolling out to members of its release preview soon. Windows 10 Insider Program, though, the company didn't say when Windows 10 May 2020 update will roll out to the general public. Brandon LeBlanc, senior program manager of the Windows Insider Program, said in a blog post that Microsoft will keep publishing new bug fixes until that time. Apple, accessory maker Nomad, recently announced that it would repurpose its Asian and North American supply chain operations to provide medical supplies to aid global pandemic efforts. Nomad is producing both civilian masks and NK95 respirators um, at its iPhone uh, case factory in China. Nomad says it shipped well over 2 million medical masks thus far and could be producing as many as 3 million per week going forward. The Economic Times, multiple sources say India's Reliance Industries Limited, the, the folks who, who make the Geo, among others, uh, the Geo service, is working with Facebook to create a WeChat rival by combining social, digital payments, gaming, and flight and hotel bookings, and along with a bunch of other features, all in a single app experience. WeChat does that in China, and it's huge. WeChat's trying to move into India. WhatsApp's already really popular in India, so it all makes sense. Reportedly, the platform would combine RIS L's retail platform and payments using fintech service GeoMoney and tap into WhatsApp's, of course, huge user base in India. Suppose you've heard of some events being postponed or outright canceled. Well, for the first time in 50 years, there will not be a San Diego Comic-Con this year. The next one will be July 2nd through the 25th of 2021. Badge holders can transfer their badge to next year or just request a full refund. Apple launched its web-based interface for Apple Music out of beta Friday. You can find it in any web browser at music.apple.com. Apple also offers TV content at tv.apple.com. Apple Music head Oliver Schuscher will also be taking the helm at Beats, replacing Beats president Luke Wood, who is leaving the company April 30th. Amazon announced a new long-form speaking style for Amazon Voice Services designed for news and music content from third-party developers. The style automatically incorporates long pauses when moving to a different paragraph or moving from one bit of dialogue to another. Amazon is also making its news and conversational speaking styles from its Amazon Polly text-to-speech cloud service available for AVS skills. I listened to both. Couldn't really tell the difference, but I guess it's there. Microsoft announced it developed a system that can distinguish between security and non-security software bugs 99% of the time using a machine learning interface with the ability to identify critical high priority security bugs 97% of the time. The system was trained on 13 million work items and bugs from 47,000 developers across GitHub and Azure DevOps repositories with the data set approved by security experts. Microsoft says the model is in production internally and plans to open source the methodology on GitHub. And following up on a story from a couple of weeks ago, Northrop Grumman announced Friday that its Mission Extended Vehicle 1, or MEV-1 spacecraft, has successfully restored Intelsat's 901 operations and relocated the satellite into position. MEV-1 became the first commercial spacecraft to dock with another in orbit on February 25th. Uh, MEV-1 will stay attached to Intelsat 901 and provide power and other services for five years, after which it will move the older satellite into a graveyard orbit, and then MEV-1 will be available to service another satellite. Uh, there's another MEV coming from Northrop Grumman uh, being sent into service, hopefully later this year, uh, to take it uh, up to the Intelsat 1002. All right, let's talk a little more about that Apple Google contact tracing platform uh, because there's lots more clarifications and thoughts and things coming out about it. 
Yeah, yeah, it's uh, there are a lot of questions and some clarifications. Wired reports more clarifications of Apple and Google's contact tracing platform. So for those who aren't caught up yet, the system is Bluetooth LE only. It's fully opt-in, collects no location data, and the little data that is collected stays on the device unless the user is confirmed positive for COVID-19 by a health agency and agrees to anonymous notification of others. So that's the whole opt-in part. The system only shares a rotating set of numbers, so it's supposed to be good for anonymity. Security experts told Wired that potential weaknesses in the system include correlation attacks. If you know the time and place where your phone got anonymous numbers associated with an anonymous infected person, you might be able to deduce who they were. Advertisers who use Bluetooth beacons in stores and then violate the terms of the contact tracing's API could also correlate identities, although... This may or may not be useful, kind of hard to say. Another problem is that the number of downloads associated worldwide with infected people could be hundreds of megabytes. So correlating location on more of a national scale could reduce that to a megabyte or two. Also, health agency apps might ask users to share GPS location data anyway. And of course, the health agency apps would know the IP address of anybody who's reporting themselves as infected. So the data is being shared on some level, the health agency already knows who the person is so that the agencies need to make sure that data isn't collected and stored anywhere it could be accessed by, for other purposes or by people who aren't supposed to access it. And then there's already reported friction between the system and the UK's NHS over the NHS's plans to create a centralized database of contacts. Yeah, the whole point of the Apple Google system is to keep you from knowing who is who. Uh, to say, we want you to know you were near a device that is associated with somebody who's infected, but we don't want you to be able to figure out who it is. But these correlation attacks are hard to defend against. If somebody can go to the trouble, uh, the Wired article uh, had an example of you set up a camera, and so you're constantly filming, uh, and then you have root access to your device so you can know what the numbers are. And if a number comes through as being associated with an infected user, you could then go back and find out, okay, uh, when I got that number first, was at this time code, I look at what I was recording and I could tell who that person was. That's a lot of work to go to. And the one you mentioned about advertisers, they already know who you are from their beacon. The only reason they'd want to correlate that with the database from Apple and Google would be to tell who might be infected in their store. And it's, it's questionable whether that would be useful, especially if it came out that they had done it and they got all the mm -hmm. bad press uh, about it. But it is, these, these are, you know, good things to know and have your eyes wide open uh, when if you're going to opt into this system uh, that, you know, it isn't 100 percent, maybe 99 percent, but it's not 100 percent. Rob, does any of this make you feel any better? Um, it, it, it does. So I was actually talking to a friend about stuff like this uh, just the other day. And they're like, if it's going to make me safer or, or, or give me the opportunity to go, you know, get checked out if I've been near someone. I'm for potentially giving up a little, you know, just a little bit of privacy because the efforts that one has to go through to figure out who you are from this are going to be, I don't want to say extraordinary, but, you're, you know, there's going to be some work, a level of work oh, that's yeah. going, to, going to be done. That's with any system anyway. Um, so this is probably going to be no more, uh, you know, nefarious than any other thing that's out there. In fact, nefarious is probably not the right word because they're, tr they're trying to build it so that it isn't going to be that way. So, um, I think that the steps that, uh, you know, Google and Apple particularly are taking to try to make sure that all this data is anonymous is, 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 is good, even though there are going to be some backdoors in, in some form of capacity. Yeah, and it seems like all of the the ways to identify it would only be when someone says they're infected, because everything else is is purely just numbers, and you, it's not associated to anything until someone says they're infected. At which point, a health agency knows you're infected, your insurance knows you're infected, anybody in your family or friends knows you're infected because it's responsible to tell them. So, you know, you're already you're already not at 100% privacy there. Anyway, I'm I'm with you, Rob. I'm willing to give up that little possibility of extra privacy. Uh, possibly being violated because of the work it would take to uncover it. So uh, Facebook has uh, added new reaction to uh, the suite. Um, so there's basically new emoticons. Um, I guess that's what you call them. So you currently have like, love, laugh, um, and a few more. Now they're going to add a care emoji um, that will start appearing next week, taking the form of an emoji face embracing a heart. It's already available in Messenger, but appears there uh, is a pulsing heart. And uh, I've read this and I looked at the story and I'm like, it's kind of cool, but 
You know, I was just hoping it's like, could we just get a you good emoji? <laughs> that's that's what I want because I'm thinking of conversations that I have with you know my friends, um, you know, particularly the guys. It's like, you good? Yep. You good? Yep. Your family good? <laughs> right. Yep. Your family. You don't good? necessarily yep. need like the happy face clutching yeah. the heart. Type exactly. thing. I mean, we yeah. already have a heart and a thumb up. Uh, uh, I feel like you good. Yeah, I want that because that with my neighbors too. Like, y'all good? Everything good? Okay. Yeah. Like that's that. Please make that happen, Facebook. I, I tried to, well, I didn't try to be snarky about the story, but I thought, you know, is this just, just a, sort of one of these dumb Facebook things of like, look, we're spreading goodwill across our platform. Yeah. And it's like, I have nothing bad to say about it, but it does <laughs> seem like an emoji that already kind of existed. You know, if I wrote something about, I don't know, a health scare or something personal or whatever, and I, I get the red heart, you know, that's mm -hmm. already been part of Facebook since the beginning. I think, uh, yeah, okay, great. You know, Tom hearted that. He, you know, thought something of it. You, as the emoji, who's looking happy, hold, holding the heart, or the heart pulsing as if you're alive, kind of the same message. It's like hugs. Yeah, yeah. I guess. Goldman Sachs estimates iPhone shipments will fall 36% in Q3 and have, in fact, downgraded Apple stock to sell. Uh, that caught some people's attention. Goldman also expects average selling prices for consumer devices in general to decline in the uh, all but assured recession. I don't think there's anybody who thinks there isn't going to be one. Uh, customers are expected to hold on to their devices longer, uh, opt for cheaper replacements if they do need them. Goldman also expects the 5G iPhone to arrive in November. That's consistent with a lot of other reports from other analysts thinking it probably won't arrive in September, October. It's going to get delayed a little bit to November. Bloomberg reports that Tim Cook also talked to Apple staff on Thursday uh, to try to let them know that, hey, yes, Apple, quote, isn't immune to worldwide economic trends, uh, but that they have the resources to weather this. He pointed out that Apple continues to pay all employees, even with stores closed in most places in the world. Uh, and of course, all of this coming in advance of Apple announcing their earnings on April 30th. Well, with Apple stores having been closed since mid-March, uh, with, you know, reopens, I mean, we had the South Korea reopening, but, you know, it, and it China, sounds... Yeah. And China, yeah. Yeah, and China ahead, uh, ahead of that. I I do wonder how the next uh, earnings report is going to be. It, it's, you know, Apple's big bread and butter report is later in the year when the, with uh, consistent with the iPhone cycle. So, and that might be a little bit delayed based on when people have expected them in the past, but it wouldn't really change the quarter, which you get in January anyway. So yeah, I, 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 I think of myself as an example. Would I get a new iPhone later this year had I been planning to, but then all of this happened in the meantime and money got a little bit more scarce and my uncertainty skyrocketed? Yeah, I mean, I'm skipping a purchase like that. You know, it's 1200 bucks. I want to hold on to that for something more important. Yeah, most people don't get new iPhones because their old iPhone broke. They get new iPhones because new iPhones exist. So what, 22 yep. million people have lost a job in the last 30 days in the United yep. States. Uh, my gut tells me that if you are struggling because you aren't employed any longer, you're not going to go out and spend eleven, twelve hundred dollars $1,200 on a new phone when your old phone literally does almost everything that that new phone does. You, you know, you, that's, that's an area that's going to get cut pretty quick. Yeah. And even if a large number of them, best case scenario, uh, those people have jobs back again because businesses are opening up again. Everybody's going to be a little nervous, even if they do have their job back and they're going to have back debts that they want to cover. So it's, it's not like those pocketbooks are going to just open right back up. Microsoft and the NBA announced a deal that would see the league use Microsoft Surface tablets and Azure cloud services. This will see the NBA move previously on-premises workloads like encoding video and indexing events to the cloud. An NBA spokesperson also said that the league was looking at how Azure would allow the NBA to augment the online fan experience like delivering games in a viewer's language, integrating chat, showing relevant stats, as well as using it to augment the league's archival footage. Yeah, this has been a trend in sports broadcasting for, for a while. Amazon, StatCast on MLB, for example. Uh, and so Microsoft, I, I think this would be a, a, an interesting story in a normal world. But in the world where the only way you're going to be enjoying an NBA game anytime soon is if they come back to play, probably not in front of crowds uh, for a while, having all of this extra stats and, 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 and enhancements to, to show people watching at home, I think is going to be pretty important. 
yeah, this is clearly not something that uh, the NBA and Microsoft started working on since COVID-19 became a thing. But the timing of it is, you know, for them is actually pretty good because you're right. Even if the arena is open um, for next season, I don't know if I want to sit next to, you know, 19,000 people <laughs> in an arena when I could actually have a more enjoyable time watching the game on, uh, you know, on my television. And I'm already there with football to where it's actually better to watch football on TV than just to watch it live. So um, this is this is going to be probably a, a boon for, you know, the NBA, um, and, you know, and Microsoft uh, as we get into the when they either restart games or get into the next season. Yeah, yeah. No, yeah, I hadn't even thought about that once they can have the crowds and that may not be until 2021 that they can, they can let crowds back in. They're going to have to do things to entice them. So there may be things that they offer to people like, Hey, these seats come with a, a tablet and, and you get in-game stats uh, as you're watching it, uh, sitting in the crowd. They may have to use that to entice people back into showing up in person. So, uh, Let's see. I think I'm next here. So storage vendors, including Western Digital, are shipping shinglet magnetic recording discs as NAS drives instead of conventional magnetic recording discs in order to get more terabytes out of fewer platters. SMR, and I like how you guys gave me this story. <laughs> SMR meaning but, shingled magnetic yeah, recording, not exactly. SMR podcast. Yeah. Exactly. But SMR discs have previously been used for archival purposes because of lower random I.O. performance. In addition to the lower performance, some users report that discs get kicked out of a race, possibly because of timeouts caused by the way SMR discs cache incoming rights. The main reason for using SMR NAS discs like the WD Red is to lower manufacturing costs. In a response to uh, blocksandfiles.com, Western Digital said, in a typical small business or home NAS environment, workloads tend to be bursty in nature, leaving sufficient idle time for garbage collection and other maintenance operations. In our testing of WD Red drives, we have not found RAID rebuild issues due to SMR technology. Oh, that, that, that verges on sounding like you're using it wrong. Uh, Western Digital was like, hey, we could save a little money. You know, people don't use their NAS drives the way an enterprise does, right? We could totally get away with this. And I know this really got under the skin of our producer, Roger Chang, uh, because you you run a NAS. So this, this bugged you. Yeah, because I actually have an SMR, Shingle Magnetic Recording Drive. And uh, quick overview, they call it that because to get more density from a single platter... They essentially over, uh, not overwrite, they overlap the right head over a previous track. So it's like shingles on a house. You have one row overlapping another. The problem with that is it really blunts your write performance. So it's great if you want to like back up all your photos and stick in the closet and maybe revisit every few months. It's going to stink if you're in an environment where you constantly need to write to and read from that drive. And Frankly, a NAS is something that I personally use quite often. In fact, more than you know, you know, 50 or 60 times a day because it is essentially a network drive on my desktop, on my Mac and PC. So I'm constantly bringing files back and forth to it. I don't know. It's it seems like kind of a it seems kind of a, a weird move by a company who wants to uh, sell more of these because I don't know, like they just really suck for writing. I mean, it doesn't it feel like they just wanted to. They just didn't think anybody would notice, and they could get away with it. Oh, oh, it, you'll, it really you, does. Go yes, ahead, Roger. It, oh no, I just like they—they they probably were saying like, "Hey, you know, maybe we won't get so many platters. We can use two of platters instead of three in these drives. We'll say we'll have extra leftover platters, and then we can still make the same number of uh, drives for this, you know, for the same amount of money, and still money. make more money." Yeah. I don't know. It's it. They thought people would notice, but honestly, people who have NASAs would be the first people to notice. It, it, I don't know. It seemed like it seems more like a, a, a move uh, from accounting or marketing than anything else. That is that's the point that I was going to make, Roger. Is the fact that why would they assume that the per, the person that is buying network attached storage for their house or for their you know for for their business, they're serious about their data, um, you know, or they wouldn't have been buying a NAS device. So why would you think that they would not notice that they can't write stuff as quickly as they could if you actually use proper hardware in such a device? Yeah. And, kind of and arrogant of them. It was, uh, and there was some confusion about whether they were properly disclosing that these were SMR uh, discs when you were buying the Western Digital Reds as well. So 
you might want to be very careful about buying these if you're if you're building a NAS for sure. And I will I will add this one bit of information. There is a subreddit on Reddit for data hoarders, and that's one of the big things they talk about. They give each other advice about which models to avoid because they're SMR drives. Yeah. So in short, SMR podcast good. SMR hard drive for your NAS not good. Two separate things. <laughs> hey, folks, if you want to get all the tech headlines each day in about five minutes, be sure to subscribe to dailytechheadlines.com. All right. Protocol has a couple of articles about what offices will look like once people are allowed to go back into them to work. In China, employees uh, have started to go back to work. Not all their offices are open even there, but the ones that are, employees are getting masks, gloves, hand sanitizer, so we've got a little look into what might be happening. Uh, what folks are expecting when you go back into offices is testing. Uh, there is something called a non-medical use test. That's a test that's good enough, but not good enough for hospital use. It's not good enough for clinical use. So you can buy those uh, for an office space to be sort of a first line of defense. Uh, they don't deprive healthcare facilities of official tests, but they can provide screening that if you get a positive, then you do a second test to be sure, because these tests aren't quite as accurate. And then if you are still positive, then you go on and get referred to a healthcare unit where you get the more accurate test. So the idea is these less expensive, easily available tests could be done maybe twice a week. Uh, the positives, like I said, would need to be confirmed. And you would have to be aware that this doesn't do anything for false negatives. This would only be a way to try to find positives and, and help those people pull out of the workplace. You're still going to have to do a lot to mitigate against somebody who is contagious and the test just doesn't know it because again, these tests aren't as, these aren't medical tests. So workspaces would still need to do social distancing. Uh, Ford Motor Company is experimenting with devices that buzz when you get close to each other. So there may be some some stuff like that where it just kind of reminds you, stay away from your coworkers. Uh, foot traffic would need to be managed. They're talking about having lanes marked out with arrows so that, that people aren't passing by each other in close proximity. Uh, food would have to be handled differently. Those, those tech companies with their communal cafeterias, they're going to have to package that stuff up. I read an article about craft services at film shoots. Uh, no more open tables of stuff. They're going to have it everything packaged and handed over uh, to people individually. Not everyone will be able to be in an office at once. Uh, they're going to have to balance staggered shifts and work from home so that you don't go over capacity. And even things like restrooms, they may need attendance to kind of make sure not too many people are getting in the restroom and clean those restrooms a lot more frequently, maybe even after every use. Uh, not to mention things like company buses, you know, the tech companies again in the Bay Area have those transportation systems that they set up themselves. How is that something they should still be doing? Will they have to reduce the number of people on the buses, check for fevers before you can board, uh, stuff like that. Rob, I know you were saying uh, you, you're, you're near to some people who are in the midst of trying to figure all this stuff out right now so yeah so my wife works in hr for a large bank here and uh this based in uh, central ohio and then i've got a uh, one of my closest friends is actually um you know executive vice president of real estate for a tele not telecom but for a uh, utility here um in the midwest and they're both going through projects where they're looking to see whether or not they bring literally thousands of people back into uh buildings that they currently have working remotely now um, and, you know, they're, they're not sure yet. They're looking at, you know, productivity. This is going to take, um, you know, a lot longer to look at than the, you know, we've really only been where we are for, you know, for less than two months. And they're looking at least six months to, you know, eight months to just look to see what the level of productivity is going to be. But, um, you know, teleworking is probably going to take a huge leap. Um, not that we weren't moving that way already, but it, it definitely got shotgunned uh, here mm -hmm. in the last couple of months. So, yeah, yeah. I, in fact, uh, I've read a couple of articles talking about how a lot of the objections the companies had have been proven wrong. Uh, people aren't less productive, et cetera. Uh, and you pointed out an article over at globalworkplaceanalytics.com kind of going through the pros and cons based on 4,000 studies, dozens of interviews with telework enthusiasts and naysayers, VCs, Fortune 500 execs, virtual employers, uh, and more. The, the list covers a lot of pros, uh, increased employee satisfaction, et cetera. Yeah. 
yeah, there, there were pages of pros. I mean, in a way, things you would expect. Employees like working from home. Um, employees save money because of they don't they don't have to commute. All that kind of stuff. But it got into like global warming and you know um, you know lessening of you know natural resources. I mean, it, there there was a just a plethora of pros to this. There were quite a few cons as well. Uh, but the cons, when you when you actually do the math and, and add everything up, um, the amount of money that organizations can save by having people work at home, um, you know, not just soft cost and productivity that you've got to actually have somebody be more productive and you save money over the year, but things that are almost immediate that people just don't call off as much because, you know, I think that um, in their reporting, they said that 83% of call offs are not because people are sick, they're because they just got something else to do. Um, and if you're already home, there's a good chance you could probably do that thing without having to call off. So they're seeing, uh, you know, hard cost and just people being in seats, um, you know, um, significantly more so than, um, when you have people coming into an office for something that could, you know, potentially be done remotely. Yeah. And, uh, I, I noticed they, they estimate the, uh, annual direct spend, per office employee to work from home is about $2,710. That's setting them up with all the things they need. That's if they don't have stuff already, right? That's providing them mm -hmm. everything. Uh, and support costs, uh, because there is some increased support where people are like, hey, I can't get this to work. Uh, they figured that was about $1,231, but that was dwarfed by the savings of not having them in the building, uh, not having to, to, to support them in ways inside the building. Uh, so it, it, it seems like for certain businesses, obviously construction sites, you can't work from home. You got to be there, right? But but for mm -hmm. tech companies, uh, a large amount of this kind of stuff might be better off just keeping it at home for the time being uh, and spending the money to upgrade people's equipment. And especially your, like your wife, Rob, and people who are uh, working for companies, uh, usually larger companies, but where the best interest of your employees is your job. You know, you want people to be happy. You want them to be be productive. You want things to run smoothly. Not everybody does well working from home. Some people work better working from home. You know, there's, you know, having to relocate to have a job that was on site that you could not do remotely. Then all of a sudden you can, well, you know, things have changed, but you know, that kind of changes the landscape of how you would recruit in the future. Uh, people have been complaining about open office uh, layouts in offices where there's no more sort of that cube life. It's like communal tables. And I mean, I was definitely one of the complainers last time I worked in an open office because I'm like, I have no privacy. Everything that's happening around me, this, it's too loud. There's no sound dampening. Every time someone walks around the corner, I'm distracted because I'm watching around. You know, that all sort of comes into play too is, you know, maybe we need a little bit more barrier situation if you're going to cram a certain amount of people in a room. Maybe you can't anymore. How does, how does the whole thing get reimagined? Yeah, and we're going to have a better handle on, okay, what are the things that we aren't getting? Like the, and there are, like you said, Rob, there are some cons in there, uh, less collaboration, less serendipity where you just walk over and run into, oh, what are you working on? Uh, there are some ways to kind of stimulate that in, in a virtual situation, but I think that's why we won't see the technology companies go fully work from home, uh, but some kind of 60% shift where you're at home more days and you come into the office, maybe there's collaborative sessions or something like that, that they try to try to get the best of both worlds uh, because you just can't have all the people in the office at the same time until there's a vaccine. Yeah, I think they're you know even referring to it as like the hotel office approach where you come into the office uh, when you need to, you don't have a cubicle, you don't have a physical office anymore. You just, you know, you know, register, hey, I'm going to be in the office these three days on this week coming up in July. And you just show up along with, you know, 10, 20 percent of the rest of your, you know, your workforce. But everyone um, in mass is generally working remote. Yeah. And GPEG84 says, as a designer, I kind of need that face-to-face -face collaboration. There's certainly going to be exceptions to this. Uh, I can think of, with my wife's job at Rotten Tomatoes, they shoot video. Like, they're eventually going to want to be in their studio shooting video. That's that's just not as good uh, when you do it from home. So there, there is there are exceptions to this, but there are lots of things that we're finding out. Yeah, the, the worry about doing this from home yeah, well, didn't really pan out probably have thoughts on this yourself and if so you can join the conversation that's happening in our discord right now in fact it's going on 24 hours a day and you can join by linking to a patreon account at patreon.com slash dtns let's check out the mailbag we got a good one from nick in response to our story from yesterday bloomberg sources saying that apple is working on some over-the-ear headphones nick says i wear hearing aids and i'd love to have over-the-ear headphones that aren't bulky i can pair my hearing aids to my iphone but I get lag and I get choppy performance. 
months. New hearing aids could fix the problem, but I'd have to spend at least $2,500 for a new set. I do have in-ear headphones. They're great for watching TV or when I'm at the gym, but if someone wants to talk to me, then I have to swap my earbuds out, put my hearing aids in, over the air, over the ear rather, headphones would make that a lot easier to do. Have a great day from a snowy day in Chicago's northwest suburbs. Also, shout out to patrons at our master and grandmaster levels, including John Johnston, Chris Smith, and Jeff Wilkes. Len Peralta has been quietly working away, drawing something for us to go with today's show. What have you drawn today, Len? Well, you know, a lot of things are going to be changing uh, when people go back to work post-COVID. The biggest change, I think, will be the boss. Mm -hmm. uh, and um, this is an image that uh, I think is going to be very prevalent. Uh, you know, some someone named Tom, Tom, Tom Nook is going to be uh, wait, wait, being a wait. big part. That's the Animal Crossing guy. <laughs> uh, yeah, but you know, I think people, I that I think he's people's bosses now, isn't he? I mean, he's he's bossing people. I think people around. may be spending more time in Animal Crossing than on their job in some cases. <laughs> it's quite I think possible. so. Yeah, I think so. So, uh, so yeah, this young lady is asking, "What happened to Gary?" And of course, Tom's going. <laughs> <laughs> um, the post-COVID workplace probably very, uh, very, very Animal different. Crossing um, in, influenced. Uh, this image is available right now on my Patreon, patreon.com forward slash Len. Also at my online store, lenperaltastore.com. I'm also doing uh, quarantine uh, birthday cards, anniversary cards, graduation cards. So check that out as well. That's on the front page. A few page. people have been sharing those with us uh, to the DTNS email. And yeah. they're, they're so heartwarming. They're so good. Yeah, it's great. It's a good way to kind of keep in touch with people when you can't keep in touch with people right now. So um, just consider it, lenperaltastore.com. Excellent. Also, thanks to Rob Dunwood for being with us today. Rob, I know you're a busy man. Where can people keep up with your work? Uh, you can just find me uh, at Rob Dunwood on pretty much anything. And definitely come check us out over at the SMR podcast. And, yeah, we, we are we are not related at all to Western Digital <laughs> and their poor decision making with their NAS devices. <laughs> what, what does SMR and SMR podcast stand for? Simple Mobile Review. Ah, so that's the roots got it has nothing to do with what the name of our show is but it's been 11 years that we've been doing it with that name so it's just kind of sticks yeah it's like espn there's no entertainment well i guess now that it's all they have is entertainment but it didn't it was mostly <laughs> Uh, hey, uh, Dan wrote in and uh, thankfully gave us uh, somebody uh, to share with you at the end of the show. We've been doing this where we're highlighting creators and causes uh, that, that we think are are deserving of your intention. Uh, so please keep sending them to us. Feedback at DailyTechNewsShow.com. Dan wanted to suggest Amanda Stone. Uh, Dan says she's a talented singer-songwriter promoting her new album at AmandaStone.rocks. That's a great URL. Uh, and you can also support her at patreon.com slash Amanda Stone. Uh, so thank you, Dan, for, for sharing the love. And you can also support us if you can. Uh, we totally understand that it's it's not something everybody can do right now, but we really appreciate all the folks who do at dailytechnewsshow.com slash Patreon. As Tom mentioned, we do have that email address and we love that you use it. Feedback at dailytechnewsshow.com. We are also live Monday through Friday, 4.30 p.m. Eastern, 2030 UTC. Find out more. Tell a friend. Dailytechnewsshow.com slash live. Back on Monday with Allison Sheridan. Talk to you then. This show is part of the Frog Pants Network. Get more at frogpants.com. Hopes you have enjoyed this program. <laughs>